Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. It's weird coming in here on a Tuesday. It is very strange, but we made it. We did. Yeah. Tuesday afternoon, feeling real weird. It's Tuesday. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, to another episode of Human Factors Cast. It's Tuesday, June 18th, 2019. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by Mr. Blake Arnstorp. Absolutely. How's everybody doing? Hey. Meeting every- Nick. How I, are you doing? I, I hope everybody's doing well. Me I'm, too. I'm okay. Especially for a Tuesday. Yeah, it's it's kind of weird. Um, I feel like I've had a full day already. and uh, Now we're going to podcast, which and, usually you and I yeah. would be dipping out of the office and going home at this point. Yeah. Um, that's okay. We we got some fun things to talk about. It's like drones week. It is it's like drones, drones, drones over here. Drones, drones, drones. We got Europe publishes uh, common drone rules, giving operators a year to prepare. Uber Elevate wants to deliver Big Macs by drone starting this summer. Uber claims aerial ride sharing is on track to be more economically rational than driving in about three years. And MIT develops a better way for robots to predict human movement. So we got drones, 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 and predicting human movement. And robots. (laughs) MIT. Uh, But first, hey, you can find us every, well, I guess today is Tuesday, so we're just going to say tomorrow. You can maybe find us today. There's Just to let everybody know, there's some delays in programming because we had, uh, we're behind the scenes, we're working some stuff over here, um, and we're still going through those growing pains. Hopefully there shouldn't be a problem next week, but... Uh, anyway, that's that's the reason for the delay. We're still here. We're not going anywhere. Don't worry. Uh, yeah, we are on YouTube. So as soon as uh, Jeff gets some time, because we usually he usually carves out Monday night to to do our video editing, and some of the behind the scenes stuff is to advance that pipeline, so that maybe maybe someday we can stream this live, which will be so much fun. It would be fun. We can get your comments and everything live in the moment, uh, and of course we'd still do the like RSS feed. Like that's not going away. Um, could you imagine doing one of these live? That'd be crazy. It'd like, be so just much fun. Getting getting content like from our listeners just kind of talking back at us as we're saying something, and they can tell us how wrong we are in the moment versus, you know, emails. <laughs> emails later than we have time to rebuttal. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, that'd be cool because then we can just fix ourselves and prevent the spread of misinformation. I like that. It's going to be um, so good. We'll have to really pump that up in Slack to see if we can get a few people that we know and love on there the yeah. first time we do it. But it'll be a fun experience once we get there. Yeah, for sure. Uh, okay, so uh, banter time. What's going on with Blake's world? Oh, I see how this is. You get to point the fingers at me. Man, I, I have zero great banter. Um, uh, let me. I don't know. I could talk. <laughs> okay, <hang on>. if you, <laughs> I don't have anything great to talk about banner-wise. There's nothing nothing new and exciting that's really popping up for me. You know what? It's been a weird week because there really hasn't been that much for me either. Like, I haven't been trying new experiences. I've been kind of, um, I don't know. I've been really highly anticipating this trip to Galaxy's Edge and to the point where I'm, like, losing sleep over it and trying to figure out how they're doing certain things and trying not to be spoiled and trying to stay off the internet. And that brings me to my banter point. So... Um, I am still pushing up against data caps on some mobile data, so I don't have unlimited. Uh, and last week, it was really funny. I got the text, hey, you're almost out of data. And um, you know, I still had like five or six days left. So I just put, put my phone in airplane mode whenever I wasn't connected to Wi-Fi. Yeah. Or I turned off mobile data. And it was amazing kind of how freeing that was um, to, you know, in situations where I wasn't around Wi-Fi to just kind of ignore my phone and technology. Um, it's almost like a tech detox in a way. It's so good. And I kind of had to plan my, like, reading the news stories or, um, you know, checking Reddit or whatever uh, around those Wi-Fi hubs. And it, it, it almost was freeing in a way. I don't know. So I used to try and do a tech detox on the weekends. Like, okay. just turn my phone off completely and not, like, interact with it at all. Uh-huh. Um, and I, the only reason I even stopped that was because when my mom moved out of the States... It was uh, just like, because that's really the time that I talk to her because I can like, right. you know, take the time and call her when it's not like too, too far ahead of the time where she's asleep or whatever. Right. Um, but it is freeing. Like it, and it's kind of nice to be unplugged from everything for a few days. It's almost, it's almost like every once in a while I do this. I don't do it often enough where I'll go like a couple days without having coffee. And then the next day that I have a cup of coffee, it's delicious and great like it's all like it's the and first one ever wired again. Yeah, yeah super wired it's the same thing with with the internet i think i think a lot of times i stop appreciating it for what it is and just like end up 
feeling myself mind numbingly like flipping through stuff or searching for things. Sure. I yeah, I will say though, like since I've been back on the internet, I've been I've been frequenting like um less popular online communities like uh like Galaxy's Edge, right? So I've been like just checking nonstop every couple minutes not at Galaxy's Edge and I'm like, wow, there's nothing new here. Why am I doing this? And I'm in this like compulsive behavior so that uh, dopamine drip circle get stuck in. Man, I've just been bored. Like I've just been bored with like the internet, I guess. I I don't know. Usually I find stuff to do and it just hasn't been hitting me. So this tech detox was nice because then I kind of sit and enjoy technology and Absolutely. I'm stoked know. for like July to start rolling around with all these like different game betas to stop popping down. Yeah. I think I'm missing some of that. Because we talked a little bit about Apex earlier. Yeah. Um, and so when that stuff starts rolling around, maybe I'll be more excited about playing games or being on the internet. But right now, I'm just not that stoked on it. I don't know. So I, I we talked about this on Infinite last week, but Stadia is uh, kind of another obsession of mine. I've just been trying to find any information I can about it. Um, so if anyone works at Google and listens to this, like, please hit me up. I, I'll sign any NDAs you want. Uh, but like, I've been trying to find out as much information as I can because I'm totally bought in on the concept just because it's so revolutionary. And uh, it's the same thing. Like there's not a whole lot of information out there. Like I'm already bought in. I just want this thing to be out. And I've been almost postponing my gratification until this happens because the big drive for me is that you can play it anywhere as long as you have data available. Uh, you know, the processing power on anyway, I've, I, I'm not going to rehash our whole conversation on infinite, but I, I am really excited for it, and I feel like I'm delaying my gratification for it. Which, because it nothing really gets concrete until things start coming out in right. November, right? And and, and yeah, even that's kind of early access. And I I don't know, like another thing that's kind of draining is the negativity around sort of or the pessimism surrounding it and how it's going to fail and how people just find things to poke in. And I'm I, you know what, just just negativity in general. I'm kind of over. Recently, Which I just like, don't understand the why behind some of the negativity around it because it's it's like it's a it is a new concept but I mean I think the people behind it and the power is there to do it. I don't know. We, we live in an age where everyone has to have an opinion, even us. I mean, we have a podcast and we give our opinion on each news story. So like, yeah, I guess there's that. Like, and I I don't know. I've been trying to be more positive. So if if you don't have any banter, I got another thing we could talk about. Here so we like, go. I've been using Visio for this really advanced workflow and. You know, Visio can get kind of clunky when you make these overly large projects. Oh, it's a very positive reinforcement project. And uh, so, yeah, it's very much program. like, you know what? I was sitting there with uh, another coworker of ours who just got on the project, and I was like, you know what? I'm just going to positively reinforce. I am thankful that Visio allows me to do this work. I'm not going to bitch and moan about, you know, the... the Have you uh, noticed that impacting, like, how you work with the tool or how you even feel about it? Because no. there is that all that kind of <laughs> nonsense that some, or I'm not sure if it's nonsense, but there is some something to be said for positive thinking about things. Yeah, I don't know. I just been trying to reflect a little bit better on like, okay, yeah, this tool does help me do this. However, there's like, I don't know. There's, I think it's largely due to the circumstances surrounding my use, which I probably yeah. yeah. But at the same time, I mean that tool it needs some help. It needs to needs as much love as as I feel like Teams gets. Yeah. Yeah. Or you get those just like constant, almost nonsensical updates. But yeah. at least it's like pushing the product forward. Whereas like with Visio, it's that one product that it that I think it has a lot of power to it, but it just needs a little bit of tender love and care. Did you notice that newest Teams update? They added emojis and now oh, instead of know all the, I know that. All the quick actions now are now hidden behind an extra thing. So like it takes me two clicks now to edit anything and i edit quite frequently like i send and say oh no i should have said this that and the other thing instead of yeah sometimes i have to learn how to spell again yeah and then uh instead i met with a, a plethora of emojis and and the like button which was the default before now is all the way on the left so it's like i gotta move more anyway there's just like a, a lot of problems i have with. I, but positively you know what it allows me to communicate with my teammates on a project that anyway it uh, allows me to s like spam some people with gifts consistently Including yourself. It's like, uh, anyway, positivity, positivity, positivity. Do you have anything? That's you the moral like of the story. <laughs> Blake, do you have anything you would like to talk about? Oh, man. I just think that positivity is a great thing. I, You know what? I think positivity is a wonderful thing, and, and hopefully we can do a little bit more of it. 
All right, so let's go ahead and get into Human Factors news. This is the part of the show where we talk about everything related to the field, human, field of human factors. This could be anything from drones uh, to drones to drones uh, or <laughs> to robots at the to end. Robots at the end. Yeah. <laughs> as long as it relates to the field of human factors, it is fair game, and we're going to be heavily focusing on the human factors application of these drones. Uh, so don't don't you worry. All right, Blake, what do we got up first this week? So there are a wide variety of topics surrounding drones. So Europe has published its common rules for use of drones. So the European Union Aviation Safety Agency says that the regulations, which apply universally across the region, are intended to help drone operators of all types have a clear understanding of what is and what is not allowed in airspace. So having a common set of rules will also mean that drones can be operated across European border borders without worrying about different regulations, depending on where you are. So once drone operators have received an authorization in the state of registration, they are allowed to freely circulate anywhere in the European Union. So this means they can operate their drones seamlessly when traveling across the EU or when developing a business involved involving drones around Europe. So the pan-EU framework creates three specific categories of operations for drones. So open or low-risk aircraft, specific where drones will require some kind of authorization to be thrown, or certified, so this is the highest risk category, where you have dr drones that may be operating for delivery or passenger drones or even fly flying over large bodies of people. And each one of these classes will have its own specific set of regulations. So the rules also include privacy provisions, such as the requirement that owners of drones with sensors that could capture personal data should be registered to operate the craft without the exception for any kind of toy drones. So Europe will be the first region in the world to have a comprehensive set of rules ensuring safe, secure, and sustainable operations of drones for both commercial and leisure activities. So finally, and that this is kind of incredible that it's going to happen across such a large body of very different countries. Yeah, I agree. I think I think categorization is correct. I think that is a great way to go about this. Um, and I think the categories make sense too, right? You have open, which is low risk craft. Uh, these are like hobbyists, um, and it sounds like these don't need uh, necessarily permission or authorization to be flown. It's just like your hobbyist, uh, you know, whatever camera drones or something um and then you have specific which these are like these are like what we'll talk about in a second with the big macs and the yes yeah, uh, like for I, specific yeah, purposes yeah. for specific purposes uh and that we'll probably have to integrate with atc at some point and some some types of uh way to manage all the drone traffic and then you have even larger drones which are more akin to helicopters really um that are going to it's like our other story it's like we got <laughs> we hit both classes of we, major drones here. <laughs> i know we we just are missing the um the what is it the the open We're yeah we need something from like dji to dji to talk about today or something like that i know this is a great way to kind of enter the news this week so yeah think about this way the uh we'll refer back to this but the second news story is specific and the third is going to be certified so um but yeah i think this is the right way to think about it you have uh, sort of these classifications and these guidelines kind of apply to the specific uh, classifications. Yeah, and it looks like this is only going to take a year to really start getting implemented. So I think that's one of the greatest points of the fact that European Union has worked pretty hard to go ahead and classify drones they're going to allow in their airspace. It's going to start taking effect in 2020. Um, and it, like that'll all kind of work out some of the kinks of like how do you register for a drone and then how do you register if you want to run like a drone based business like some of these deliveries or any kind of like aircraft support stuff um it's it'll be interesting to see how this compare contrasts with what the faa has been putting together because we've talked about at least i don't i don't know how many times in this podcast them going through and trying to set up you know national guidelines for delivery drones and everything like that so it'll be interesting to see how who's able to kind of implement the set of rules that work the best, depending on what region you're in. Yeah. Uh, so I'm looking at the requirements for each category, right? So open here, uh, set out and deregulate. Okay. There's like a bunch of jargon here. Unmanned aircraft, maximum takeoff mass of less than 25 kilograms. Uh, remote pilot ensures the unmanned aircraft is kept at a safe distance from people and is not flown over assemblies of people. Uh, remote pilot keeps the unmanned aircraft in uh, vertical what is v -loss? line of sight. Vertical line of sight, probably uh, visual line of sight at all times, except when flying in follow me mode or when using an unmanned aircraft observer. 
Um, during flight, the unmanned aircraft is maintained within 120 meters, and during aircraft does not carry dangerous goods. And that's open. So that that definitely does kind of fit the mold there for like hobbyist level um, drones. And then you have specific where um, it's a little bit more complicated. It looks yeah, like. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, you have to apply for authority to do this. Uh, there has to be risk assessments performed um, in accordance with other laws and legislation. Um, and then there's other laws that you have to be compliant of. Uh, the authority, the competent authority shall issue an operational authorization, blah, 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 I'm reading through this, looking for interesting tidbits here. The so, yeah, go ahead. Is there anything in there that specifically talks about, because I know I think it only applies for specific and the higher class. But certified. The, certified, but they talk a little bit about at the end here that along with just the regular regulations, you're going to have these privacy provisions that come along with it. So if you're operating a drone and it's got sensors that could be picking up people's data of any kind, um, it has to be registered with, uh, with the European Union or with whatever state you're registering it in. And I'm assuming they that by doing that, it's kind of subject to, you know, you won't be using it nefariously or whatever it may be against people. Yeah, I'm looking at, uh, let's see here, considering the risks to privacy and protection of personal data, operators of unmanned aircraft should be registered. If they, ha if they operate an unmanned aircraft, which is equipped with a sensor able to capture personal data. However, this should not be the case when an, the unmanned aircraft is considered to be a toy within the meaning of blah, 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 specific things. So, um, so I'm assuming toy doesn't fall under specific. Yeah, and I'm wondering if that, like, would a hobbyist drone can be considered a toy, right? Like, I don't know, because like, when you're saying, like, identifiable personal information, couldn't that be, like, a camera. you know, taking video from a an open... Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I don't know. So that's that's kind of an odd and strange draw, because I would think that open would be definitely stuck in this kind of prov privacy provision problem. Um, but it looks like it only applies really specific, and then, uh, again, to certified. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm not seeing anything, like, otherwise specifically called... Oh, um, operational conditions for uh, geographical zones. Let's see here. When defining geographical zones for safety, security, privacy, or other... Okay, yeah, no, it's just defining the zones. All right. At yeah. least it's, like, good to be forward thinking about this, because, I mean, we've talked about it, at least in the States, of using drones for stuff like police surveillance, surveillance and act yeah. activity like that, and as part of, like, the smart city, quote-unquote, architecture and infrastructure stuff. So, I mean... Uh, having that kind of stuff baked into the guidelines is only going to help, you know, the everyday person who's not flying a drone around or who doesn't participate in the services willingly, willingly and stuff like that. Yeah. You ready to talk about uh, the Big Mac? Yes. Best story. <laughs> and the story that's making me the hungry today. So move over Uber Eats. Uber Elevate plans to deliver food via drone as early as this summer. So to start, the service will be available here in Nick and I's lovely home place of San Diego. That's here. And since Uber has been working closely with McDonald's, it will likely be optimized for things like the Big Mac and fries. So Uber Elevate doesn't plan on delivering food directly to your door, at least not yet. So to avoid dropping items on unsuspecting pedestrians or causing excessive noise pollution, the drones will fly to designated landing zones. They may land on the top of roofs of parked Uber cars, and then couriers are going to collect the deliver deliveries and carry them the last leg of the journey. Still, Uber Elevate says that delivering food 1.5 miles via a drone will take about seven minutes compared to the 21 minutes the same trip via ground transportation would take. So Uber Elevate plans to unveil its own customized drone later this year and claims it could reach up to 75 five miles per hour. But the company is still waiting on FAA regulations and approval uh, to kind of move that stuff forward in the States. But Nick and I have talked about this. We got really excited when it first came out. I couldn't even really believe it when Nick was telling telling me about it. But I can't wait to give this a shot, at least, just to even, yeah. even like talk to the driver about what the experience is like. Because it's unlikely that we're going to see these 
drones dropping stuff off on top of Uber cars right. unless we can figure out where a drop off zone is. Yeah. So you and I had a pretty lengthy discussion about this when I saw it. I was super excited. I was like, Blake, we got to talk about this on the show. Uh, let's rehash our first article here and say that this one falls into the specific uh, category if you're going by that um, European uh, Aviation Safety Agency. Uh, so specific, meaning this is for a very specific purpose. Anyway, we had a conversation about this earlier this week. Um, so to let our listeners know, we will be ordering Big Mac and fries or whatever it is from McDonald's to try this out. Uh, as soon as this is available to us, we're going to take video of it and upload it to our Slack so you all can see how this works. Um, my assumption for this is that they are testing out initially, and the the kind of part that stuck out to me was that they're not going to be delivering to your door. And I think the reason being is that I don't know if the fidelity is good enough yet for, I mean, like, GPS fidelity is pretty good at this point. I don't know why they wouldn't choose to do that, maybe for the safety of people Ooh, this is a new service. They don't want to drop it on anybody's head. So what they're doing is they're going to land on on uh, you know cars within their own network, and then that driver will then take it to the doorstep. And uh, that's what Blake was alluding to. With we want to talk to that driver and say like, what do you think this is like? You know, and and I think the reason why they're doing or or the way this will work is they're not necessarily going to be like. You know, they, they land on a car and then that car takes it the last leg. I think literally what will happen is Blake places an order. It goes to McDonald's and it goes to that Uber driver at the same time. That Uber driver starts driving towards the location. And once it's parked right outside the location, that drone comes down, lands on the car and then drops off the food, takes off. And the driver then takes the food and walks it up to the door. So it's just adding in that human element uh, while they are testing out this technology and probably for, like, um, landmarks in these landing spots. Yeah, because I feel like it's going to have to... They'll have to iron out what it really feels like to be navigating these things. Are they able to do, like, batch orders at once? How does a drone really handle by itself? And this creates a lot of a low-risk environment for them because it's just landing on assets they already have. It's people that already work for the company, so they, I'm assuming they'll get some sort of training on how to deal with a drone right. if it malfunctions and that kind of stuff. I think it's a great test case, too, in San Diego um, for a lot of reasons, but I think one might be because they were worried about noise pollution. I think they'll have more areas that they'll be able to fly drones and land them without having to worry about restrictions on noise pollution. Yeah, so they'll I mean, have more drop-off areas. We're right here by Miramar. Exactly, yeah. Then, uh, then downtown, I mean, yeah, you can't really avoid it. The airport's like in the middle of middle of the city. Yeah. Um. So it, it'll be interesting to see how over time the process gets better because I feel like for I feel like for Uber Elevate to work out, this has got to work more in a batch ordering system versus yeah. like just single like okay, Blake ordered something. All right, let's get it to a driver and then have the driver drive it to him. It's got to be like Blake and Nick and some other coworker that may or may not eat mcdonald's ordered something they're right. all going to a similar location let's get it to somebody that can take it to them right and yeah it's it's curious right are these drones equipped to handle those orders and if so how does it prioritize those orders and i think perhaps that's still what they're working out like i would imagine you could load like three or four meals in here and uh you know at lunchtime you have like Uh, a route that it takes based on optimization and you put certain orders in there and it drops it off, you know, like I'm, I'm long-term now, like there's containers or whatever that segment your orders in the bags. And then it drops a bag off at one location, picks up, goes to another location, drops out the next bag, but they've been layered in, um, you know, in such a way that it's just an easy drop off next location. And then it returns to home base and keeps doing that. Yeah, and I wonder what it looks like in the future, because I, I think I'm kind of of the opinion that you are that this is stage one just a, as a test case. Right. Like we're gonna we've got a city we think this will work in. We have a good partnership with McDonald's. Let's try this out. But I wonder what it, it's going to evolve into when the drone no longer needs a last leg drive. Like does that mean Wonderful. we have to have specific, you know, do businesses end up getting paid by Uber to have, you know, some like where we work in a giant tech park? Would there be a landing pad that's, you know, 
right. space is purchased from What's by Uber. Yeah, and then what does it look like for people from there? I mean, do we just walk out our office door and go grab it? It's, I don't know. I think it yeah. could be pretty pretty lucrative on a lot of different companies' parts, and, especially and, Uber. And think about this, too. Like, this is kind of the um, the worrisome part for me is that, like, uh, right now there's a lot of talk about Uber employees and how they're not considered employees. They're considered, like, gig workers, and, and so they're not getting things like health benefits or whatnot. This is just one more way to automate people out of a job. And, um, you know, when if you think about the cost it takes to deliver through DoorDash or Uber or whatever you use, um, there's a premium on top of that. And that's to pay the driver to go pick it up and drop it off at your door. Uh, and you have tip. And now what this does for people like you and I, who don't necessarily drive with food, but we order food, um, this eliminates the tip and that reduces costs for us. However, they can still keep that same cost of, of like that premium cost. That premium, yeah. yeah. And so they're pocketing everything without having to pay employees. So like from a business perspective, it makes a whole lot of sense to invest a whole lot of technology in this. Um, or at least give it resources. a shot. Cause I just don't, I don't know that drones are the, the thing that are going to make this is, possible i think the first instantiation we have of what a drone's going to be like for a delivery service is going to be really clunky and we're going to see that like you know 20 years down the road and it'll be something completely evolved and different from what we expect a drone to be now absolutely yeah that's true. but at the same time although it it will automate jobs out i think it's going to create a lot of supervisory roles because this sure. ultimately this is pretty dangerous in some ways because i mean depending on how f- high this thing is flying you could it, at the very least give somebody a concussion if it happened to hit them or if it falls in the car and bangs up their car but at least they get a free meal out of it so it, i mean like yeah i know right be... <laughs> there is that i mean the, okay i want to talk about metrics here so it says um they're they're delivering food one and a half miles via drone will take about seven minutes compared to 21 minutes for the same trip via ground transportation now is that considering um prep time as well or is that just right? Because like they can turn that stuff around based on an order. They get that out the door pretty quick. Um, think about drive-through, right? Like you drive through somewhere and it's done pretty quick by the time you get up to the window. Um, depending Absolutely, on the place. Yeah. Um, sometimes it takes a little longer. But if you actually think like they're saying seventy miles per hour, that's about a mile a minute, just over a mile a minute. And if they're saying a mile and a half would take seven minutes, I'm wondering if that does include that prep time as well right and probably if you think about like ordering something and then seven minutes later it's at your door that's insane yeah it's pretty pretty crazy right i mean we we thought that just like amazoning something and getting in the next day same was day. nuts or, or same day yeah, or like going yeah. to be able to pick it up in like two hours was nuts well like in seven seven to ten minutes you've got food that you ordered from your phone yeah and that that's we're living in the future and, but we uh, really are i mean the I don't know. I want to talk to the Uber drivers that end up doing this because yeah. I think it'll be a really interesting experience to hear from their, their perspective. Because, I mean, what are they having to listen to in terms of, like, are they just are they just seeing this thing come up on the app and, like, hit the delivery spot? Are they having to interact with, like, quote, unquote, you know, Uber's own air traffic control little station? Right. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I have no idea. It just it sounds like it's going to be fun to fun to hear about and fun to experience. Yeah, for sure. All right, well, we'll be back to break down other news stories about drones right after this. Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in Human Factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon, now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is human factors, etc. We're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember, it depends. I gotta say, I really enjoyed our infinite conversation last week about Stadia and the future of gaming, and what else did we talk about? We talked about 
Galaxy's Edge. There's a lot of stuff that we talked about last week. Yeah, we even broke down a bunch of like the E3 stuff that was coming out. As yeah, well, that's true. We did some like li- almost like live reaction type stuff to it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, I had a lot of ton, and uh, so we took a break from the American Space Program, but we're going to be back to that I think next week. Uh, potentially we'll see yeah and then it's documentary time right documentary time i'm so excited um all right so hey before we continue i just want to thank all of our friends over at bloomberg and gadget and TechCrunch for all of our oh and gizmodo for all of our news stories this week if you want to follow along you can follow us on social media or join us on our slack for links to the original articles and we post those as we find them uh that slack's been pretty active with articles this week man like all these drone stories uh, speaking of drone stories, we got one more up. What do we have up next? In case you were sick of drones, so the ride-sharing giant announced that Melbourne, Australia will join the cities of Dallas and Los Angeles for test for its aerial ride-sharing electrical vertical takeoff Uber Air service that is its that's its third at its third annual Uber Elevate event. So with test flights scheduled for next year and to target a launch date of 2023. So Uber also debuted designs for the interior of its taxis as well as concepts for their sky ports at the event so listing the challenges last year ranging from inadequate present-day battery and electric flight technology and the sheer volume of passengers that uber uber claims it will be flowing through these sky ports to the fact that autonomous passenger flight systems remain in the realm of science fiction the drive dubbed the uber air plan a delusional fantasy that would not pass scrutiny in the competent vc boardroom were it not for magical thinking itself (laughs) what in the world in less than what 40 years they're going to be trying to test and have skyports not only in melbourne australia but also in la and dallas to do aerial ride sharing so the 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 title of this article was that uber is claiming that aerial ride sharing is going to be more economically rational than driving in about three years and um i think what this article is pointing out here is that uh, here's pessimism for you. It sounds like that's not feasible based on current technological limitations, uh, bureaucratic limitations, et cetera, et cetera. Um, however, uh, let's just take a step back. Let's look at these designs first. Okay, so did you did you take a look at these designs, Blake? So they they unveiled basically their designs for these um, passenger drones that allow you to basically get in, sit down, have the thing take off and land um and you get out and they've also detailed uh concepts for their sky ports um that will uh be centralized hubs for boarding these things so they don't have to basically um operate out of airports or you know i don't think they're compact enough to basically pick you up anywhere Uh, but theoretically these would be facilities that in which case you can um sort of get to and then get out of there they look like small planes to me yeah they do they look like small planes with doors that a car would have and the seats look pretty pretty comfortable i mean this is pretty nuts to look at it doesn't i'm thinking in the front i'm not quite sure if there's like a dashboard that is showing up in the front but i'm assuming that the that in the front seat that nobody's driving i would assume so too that's just somebody that that's passenger space so that's that's pretty incredible that they're kind of because one one thing to think about this is concept design, right? So this is just like a built model that they've you know shot photographs in and that kind of stuff to make it look awesome. But the design itself is pretty great looking. It's a small pod with it looks like two, four, maybe six seats, um, and I guess they're purporting like vertical takeoff and landing, uh, which is even even more kind of like space saving and energy saving and all that kind of stuff. So I don't know, man. The design looks looks pretty dope but at the same time this is a concept that's just been built sure so to recap this would fit kind of in that um that certified right this would be that or yeah, yeah this would be the certified this is definitely category. certified because it's carrying passengers right which you'd imagine would have to go through some like faa regulations and everything like that if, if we're going by the european standard um there's a there's a funny tweet the other day uh by at thomas violence the good news, the upper half of my body was sheared off. Only my legs are left by the rotor of an Uber Air vehicle that crashed into my living room while I was watching TV. The bad news, the pilot effectively made $7 an hour after accounting for the maintenance cost. Oh, no. <laughs> that's no good. Yeah, I mean, that's that's a whole other thing, right, is what does this look like for pilots? Because uh, as far as I'm understanding and based off of the blurb that I read, I mean, the, the, 
the delusional fantasy part is the fact that we're we're moving towards autonomous passenger flight systems. Right. So yeah. now we're talking about like a UAS type operator at best, um, where more likely the goal would be that that's like a supervisory role that's watching automation for any kind of like, you know, last minute I need to step in as a human type thing. I mean, but like take take the FAA's um, kind of perspective on this. So Dan Elwell, who is the uh, FAA administrator um, at the actual Uber Elevate conference, said said this. These are these are truly some of the most exciting developments in aerospace since the Wright brothers. Uh, but I put my I put on my FAA regulatory hat and I get a whole new bucket of stuff to worry about. I see car sized vehicles with multiple rotors hanging over dense urban populations. Um, so that definitely is a concern, right? And, uh, I, I think it's not going to be ultimately the technology that holds us back. I think it's going to be legislation. I think it's going to be a lot of like figuring out the logistics of trying to incorporate something like this into our transit system as it is now, right? You have, you have, uh, Elon Musk who's digging down and trying to go underneath everything. And then you have, companies like uber who are trying to go up and above everything and like all this stuff acting independently and not communicating with each other um and and then to add another layer of complexity once you have uber up there it's not like they own the sky you have uh different airlines which i mean thankfully they're all getting along now enough to communicate to where you know crashes are less likely to happen and presumably once other companies get up in that airspace that will happen as well and communicate communication will be seen as a mutual benefit to everybody involved. Um, and then like, how does that interface with our infrastructure? We're talking about skyports here. Um, yeah, which is going to like obviously require entire, you know, spaces in different cities. So you, now you've got to get them on board, to even al- be that, allow that to be built in their city to kind of support this kind of commerce. And right. can, can, you know, Lyft or whoever else use an Uber Skyport, or does that mean that each company has to have their own own Skyports? And then, yeah, like what? Do you Sky- end up with some kind of regulatory ATC company right. that's across all of them, or does Uber have their own specified kind of controller system? And then you've got Lyft, and how do they interact with each other, or do they interact with each other? Um, the the one thing that I think makes sense from a story we talked about, I do believe last week. Is like the benefit of autonomous vehicles is really not going to be seen until every vehicle on the road is autonomous, right? So what happens if we're flying aircraft? And I, I don't think that these particular th- particular things, especially for the flights they're talking about, are going to be breaching any kind of airspace that the FAA has to be concerned with commercial aircraft in. Right. But if they're flying close enough in zones like near airports or if there was an emergency landing for whatever reason, if everybody's... If somebody's flying by, you know, visual flight rules versus autonomous flight rules, what does that mean? Well, it produces right. a bigger risk yeah. for people's lives and stuff like that. So I think there's so many kinks to be worked out. But at the same time, I mean, it wasn't too long ago when Musk decided to flip everything over and decide he was going to make an electric car company, which is not the same endeavor that's going on here. But it was something that said that wouldn't wouldn't do anything or wouldn't be of any kind of use. And now we're talking about autonomous vehicles in everyday context so i don't know i mean this could be the next wave of how we think about transportation and how we think about about autonomy and how we think about aircraft yeah yeah i mean the whole point is that this could become more economical um or at least that's what uber's claiming and if that's true that's great because uh you know if we can reduce emissions and congestion at the surface level by taking to the sky I'm all for it. Absolutely. And I I'm like I like seeing Uber double down so hard to try and figure this out cuz it wasn't it Uber like 2 years ago when we talked about this in I think it was in Dubai. They were going to have the first Skyport originally. Yeah. And it was an Uber like it, that concept has not changed or the concept art hasn't changed at all. And now they obviously for whatever reasons that didn't work out so they doubled down on Australia as being somewhere where they could test these a lot of these things and do test flights in and now it's coming to the US. So I just like to I like that they're trying to go at it so hard to figure this problem out and see if there is any viability to it. Yeah, I don't know. It's like it's weird because change is so slow and then once it actually happens like I I feel like it will be different once we actually see this happen. Like once we see drones integrated with our lives, once we order that McDonald's from 
you know, the other drone and actually see it dropped off at an Uber car outside of our work, that's when I think it will hit me. But right now, you just reminded me of something. Like, we've talked about news stories like this for the past three years. Yeah, that's um, true. And we still haven't seen any real major tests. Like, I haven't seen personally. Like, uh, tests probably happen, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, They've they, happened. This won't come out of nowhere, right? Right. They, but, like... In an urban environment, we have not seen it happen, and I have not personally seen it with my own eyes, and until they start getting that word of mouth, like, yeah, I saw this VTOL vehicle, like, people won't say that, but they, I, I saw this big drone that was carrying people from point A to point B, or I saw, <laughs> I saw somebody get their McDonald's delivered by a drone. Like, once people are talking about it at that level, I feel like the public's excitement, because this is, this is very niche, right? Like, people, like, Tech enthusiasts, people that listen to this podcast, people that understand the challenges of integrating these types of technology with our lives uh, are interested in this kind of thing. But I don't think the public really is. It's like, uh, for the most part, they're probably just trying to figure out what they're doing for that day. Um, Absolutely. And I mean, even still for us to a large degree, this is very like Jetsons world type stuff. Yeah. But once it does hit, I agree with you. I think once we see, once we see in San Diego, the McDonald's delivery stuff. I think if it's successful, it's gonna it's gonna like exponentially rise like Kurzweil type stuff, like grow so fast when have so many companies trying to get on board with it. And the same thing if they can get this ride sharing concept to work, I feel like I feel like you see more and more people doing that. Expect even if it is only a smaller group of people who maybe can afford the capability to be flying to wherever they need to be. And it takes a while for Uber to scale it down to where everybody right. can use it. I still think there's massive utility in the and the pace that it's going to grow, and the other companies that are gonna, that are going to evolve out of it, like another type of Tesla or whatever who's building these things specifically, or different car companies trying to get into the aviation space. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's all it's all really interesting to me, and hopefully, uh, you know, all these news stories together is uh, an indication that that we're moving in the right direction for. Uh, for drones. Absolutely. All right, we got one more news story up here. What is it not about drones? So Why? it's not about drones. So people and robots working together has tremendous tremendous potential for factory and construction site settings, but ro robots are Rose. also potentially incre potentially incredibly dangerous to people, especially when they're when they're large and powerful, which is typical in the case of for industrial robots. But a new algorithm created by MIT re researchers could make humans and robots work together even safer. So researchers working with the automaker BMW and observing their current product workflow noticed that the robots were overly cautious when it came to watching out for the humans that, that are in the plant. They'd lose lots of potentially productive time waiting for people to cross their paths long before there was a potentially any chance long before there was any chance of people actually doing that. So now they developed a solution that greatly improves the ability of robots to anticipate the trajectory of humans as they move, allowing robots that typically freeze in the face of anything even vaguely resembling a person walking in their path to continue to operate and move around the flow of human foot traffic. So leave it to MIT to me. I, I mean, because we've talked a little bit about some of the different algorithms, but definitely some of the robotics that have come out in the industrial setting from them. But now... They're trying to optimize that pat, that workflow for, I guess, BMW in this case, which makes sense, right? Because you would want something to be overly cautious when it comes to robots interacting with humans or stopping for humans. But in this case, it's like, okay, you're we've designed something that's a little too cautious. Yeah, I mean, there's a that that's a great point. It's like you want I, I, I okay. I have so many thoughts on this. First off, um, this is great. For a variety of reasons, this in, this increases productivity on the robots part, especially when it's like trying to um, basically wait on the human by being safe. And um, when it actually is optimizing for, you know, waiting on the human, when it, it, it takes these chances, when it knows humans are not going to act, um, I feel like there's a lot there's a lot of time that's saved and it still doesn't sacrifice the, the safety of the human. Um, so 
in terms of the specific algorithm, you can look, go look at the MIT thing if you want to see that. Yes. Um, but it's basically a, a better way of anticipating human movement, um, which, I mean, like, if you think about it, is not really consistent. It involves a lot of starts and stops. People do things. They're pretty erratic. Yeah. Especially, like, in a factory worker performing this, or, like, even in a factory worker performing the same tasks, the same kind of, like, repeatedly thousands of instances, they're... There can be an instance where, like, they turn around and uh, go walk over to something else that the computer couldn't necessarily pick up on. I mean, alone, just myself going to get my lunchbox every day, I go a different path, I'll right. stop in somebody else's office or whatever. So I can imagine it's similar on, like, the workshop floor. Maybe you do it, do a process a different way or try out something brand new or end up running into somebody on the floor or whatever it may be. Yeah, they do go on to, to uh, outline some of the commercial applications of this, like, Applying this technology to in the home of like elderly for elderly care, you know, having those robots in home that are uh, they say that, you know, movements in home are a little bit more predictable. Um, You probably follow the same path for the same tasks out of habit at home. Um, So I don't know. It could be uh, could be good for long term uh, robotics for in home elderly care. And maybe you kind of learn you can maybe learn projected movement paths for one person a lot easier in one confined space like a like an entire workshop floor for bmw i can't imagine how big the facility is yeah and then how many workers you may have like both you know cycling in cycling out for shifts those that like are new or those get fired and stuff like that so you almost you almost may be getting pattern recognition but you're not really able to keep it or learn that much from it so it's probably a lot of work to figure out like okay how do we make sure these things aren't hitting people and, but at the same time, we're not costing the company like a lot more money in terms of time um, by like having to wait and stop and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I'm a uh... having a larger robot in the home would be pretty insane. Yeah, that would be. Um, I wonder how that would if it would like have to be built in the infrastructure of the house or whatever. I would imagine so. So like the the way this works, I'll jump into a little bit. So it's like consistently anticipating how the human might respond. Um, but the, the way, the way it typically happens is it kind of like anticipates that a human might go and it kind of stops. Um, but this, this new algorithm kind of just takes the chance for like, whenever it sees it stop at a new point, it just kind of says, all right, yeah, it's probably not going to go. I'm just going to go. And, uh, that's the best way I can describe it. There's, there's an accompanying video, um, for the article, and I think that does a lot better job of explaining, you know, how how these robots and this um, this algorithm works. But you can see, like, one is clearly waiting longer, anticipating, like, being overly cautious when it could just take that opportunity and go while the human has its back turned. Um, it's almost like it's a little bit more risk averse or more risk seeking here because yeah and it's it's kind of funny and this is pro- this is really my horrible layman's way of describing it but it almost seems like that once what especially in the video if you watch it's kind of like you got the robot that's moving on a straight line path and you have a human that's kind of passing along cross in front of it um so it's kind of like going perpendicular to each other but there, as the robot's coming, it's almost with the algorithm in place, it's like assuming that, okay, once the humans passed and made it to the other side of the road, if you will, that they're, it's almost like the robot is acknowledging like, okay, the human's seen me and it knows that I'm going to continue going on my path. If they start moving backwards, maybe they should be able to figure out to stop or not get in my way. Right. Um, so it's like, it's almost as like if the algorithm's using a little bit of that logic we use with like crossing the street with cars that like you don't want to drive in walk in front of something that's moving really fast. You walk behind it. Yeah. 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 I don't know. Go check out that video. It's it's pretty cool. All right. Uh you know what time it is? What time is it, Nick? It is time for It came from It came from It's time for me to hit that button and say it came from Reddit because we are checking all over Reddit to bring you news stories, not news stories, topics that the community is talking about any subreddit's fair game as long as it relates to the field of human factors. Uh, it is fair for you know you and I to sit here and talk about. Absolutely, um, we we got uh, two. How much time? Uh, yeah, we got two. I think. Wait, wait let me check. Yeah, we got. Uh, we got time for both of them. Let's do it. Well, let's just bo- do both of them. Uh, let's see here. This first one here is posted by uh, user Trazan. 
spelled Tarzan wrong. Um, <laughs> Bummer. Maybe Tarzan was already taken, so they had to go with the Probably. next best. I'm assuming this is from the user experience subreddit. It is. Uh, so this one is uh, starting my first mid-weight role in six weeks. How can I prepare? Um, mid-weight. I'm not sure what that means. I, I've done UX for almost two years after switching from copywriting. Uh, last week, I was offered a new job with a big pay raise and some solid career development prospects. I'm set to begin in six weeks. How can I prepare in the meantime? Admittedly, I'm a bit nervous. So it sounds like, um, like I'm I'm confused. When I first read this, I thought I was I thought they were preparing for a fight. I'm going into a middleweight fight, and I'm six weeks out. What do I do? Yeah, well, you bulk up on your uh, UX. You train hard. You train hard, but still stay at your weight class. No, I thought it was something that we haven't really talked about before, about like if you're getting some sort of new job, how do you prepare for it? Or is it something that you've even considered, right? Like, Because for me, I remember getting my first job was like from an internship. And so I was kind of already in the role, so I never really had to be too worried about what right. I was preparing for because I'd been learning on the job as I was going. Um, I knew skills that I wanted to walk into the job with, but also stuff that I wanted to improve upon. So I, I kind of like figured out things that I want, like learn how to code or becoming a bit better visual sure. designer. I had things that I wanted to work on outside of the job. But I know that you've like you've had more jobs than I have. I mean, how did you prepare for your next big kind of gig each time they come, or did you just kind of walk into it as like, all right, here's day one, let's that go. That one, yeah. I mean, like, look. So the the thing is, when you go and interview for a job. You're interviewing for a job, and they're testing you. And if you pass the test, they hire you. And so you're hired. And, like, I don't know. I, I'm of the mind, like, yes, you can prepare. You can, But, I mean, you do that before the interview, even. You research the company. You look at the types of things that they're doing. You uh, ask about the types of projects that they're working on during the interview. Like, that is your time to learn, too. And if you don't take advantage of that, then that's on you. But you can still go out of your way to ask, like, HR of the company, like, hey, what kind of things can I start to prepare for when I'm starting in six weeks? Like, there are ways to learn. Um, if you've done UX for two years, or or even any job, like, let's say you've just done two years of a job, um, you know, I think you'll get a lot of on-the-job training. I think either way, right? Every company has their own way of doing things, and you'll have Absolutely. to acclimate to that. And um. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Like you, You'll be fine. Just walk in. What about you, yeah. Blake? What do you think? I mean, if you're really terrified it, you or if you're just anxious to start the new job, I, I mean, you could always reach out to if you know your direct supervisor, like things you could get started on. If you're going to work on like a project by project basis, get some, right. get a sense of that. They'll think you're an eager, eager worker and all that kind of stuff. So that might be good. Um, I don't know. I wouldn't worry too much about it because if you've done two years, at the very worst, you've convinced somebody that you should be in this new position that pays you more. Yeah. And great. Go in there and do the same good work you've done for two years and learn and be ready to learn and kind of like having your head as you go through and learn more from the people you're going to be working with from your project managers have like things that you want to improve for the company. But that's more of like on your first few weeks of the job, figuring that kind of stuff out. I've got a feeling that because like this is the first mid tier position, I'm assuming what mid weight means. Mid weight. Um, midway championships and they're getting more money they're putting more pressure on themselves that they have to be Probably. somebody that they're not quite or they feel like they're gonna walk into this job and feel a massive amount of imposter syndrome i would just say go ahead and put that behind you because it's not you've already like passed the test you're going in the door even even if you failed miserably, you're probably going to learn stuff on the job anyway that'll take you to the next job or you know don't d deal with the imposter syndrome like that's uh, you know accept it it happens. That happens. Like in your first job, you're probably going to feel that hardcore. Um, when in reality, you are probably closer to you know uh, your training than anyone else in that job, and they've kind of fallen into their ways. Not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying you might have a unique perspective that you can bring to that table, and that's an opportunity that you can look for rather than a weakness. You know, of not knowing how that company does things. Absolutely. I think if I think if they're nervous, then it's probably just a sign of probably somebody who's really going to be good at their job because they want to be impressive. All right. We got time for one more. <gasps> uh, this one's from user Chandra381. Um, great name. And this is also from the user experience subreddit. Apart from specific subreddit communities, what other UX communities or human factors communities uh, do you frequent? I'm curious how to how to... Uh, you're not the only one who can't read today, Blake. I'm curious to know if there are other various forms of Discord channels, for instance, 
I'm sure many others are. I'm sure many others are too. Or consider a related question: What's your best source for keeping up with what's new in the UX field, uh, or in our case, even vectors? So this is going to sound super cheesy, but the only way I stay up with stuff that's in human factors is talking to people yeah. more so than like going any specific place. I'm, I feel like a dinosaur. I still like read through the ACM magazines that I get every, get every month because that's kind of a nice way just to keep the pulse of what's going on. Sure. But the other place for human factors stuff and UX resources, I look in our Slack from what people are putting inside of it. Because the, I've never learned so much about technology from different people to listen to the show or have like takes or thoughts on stories that you'll post in there. And so that's a great way to keep a pulse as any kind of UX Slack or human factor Slack like our own. Um, one big one in terms of like how do I like how do I keep up with things that I'm interested in is, you know, local meetups. So that could be HFES, that could be, you know, UX speakeasy here in San Diego. There's just a lot. Of, I think I get more out of like a lot of in-person relationships and learning from other people than just through the internet means. Maybe because I'm just not really good in chat rooms. I don't know. But that's kind of the places that I get the most information. Yeah, I, I would like to second that and say we are very fortunate to work in a building full of human factors people. And so it's not uncommon for somebody to come up to me and say, hey, have you heard about this thing? Uh, and that's really exciting to me because like you, I I get my information through word of mouth. I also do keep up with a couple news sources. Obviously, um, there are some uh, media outlets that we keep up with more frequently than not here on the show, even like Gizmodo and Gadget. IEEE has been a big one over the past IEEE's two years. IEEE has been sure. good. Yeah, so there's a lot that we keep up with on the tech side of things, uh, and we pick out the human factors related stuff. Uh, to to bring to you guys, you know, we we do source our articles from a, a variety of different places as long as it kind of um, contributes to the discussion. I will say though, um, you know, like like Blake said, our our Slack is a good resource. Um, also, like as as cheesy as it is, LinkedIn is pretty good for like following the people that you know. Uh, you're probably going to have a lot of connections uh, with people who have related interests to you. Um, or you've made a connection with at some point, and if you can kind of keep up with the research that they're doing or the work that they're publishing or what their companies are doing, uh, that's another way to kind of keep a pulse on on uh, what's going on out there. Um, as for Discord channels, I don't know. And I've toyed around with the idea of a Discord uh, for us. For HF, or for yeah. Factors Cast. Yeah. However, I don't, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know. If you guys are listening and find, like, that a discord would be better than Slack. Like, let us know. That's something that we can explore. Absolutely. Um, yeah. We just kind of pick Slack because I know there's a couple design communities that use Slack. Um, and it's, I don't know, it's a little bit more accessible in like a workplace. Uh, so like if you needed to reference human factor stuff, anyway, if you, if you have interest in a human factors cast discord, let me know. Uh, we can get that going. But um, also you mentioned um, meetups and conferences, I think is is a good way too um you know if you go to the same conferences every year you kind of can touch base with some people that maybe you haven't interacted with um you can see some of the research that's being highlighted uh at these conferences and really get a sense of what's going on um Speaking of conferences, we are in early talks with HFES to the early stages to bring you content from the the uh, conference this year, and um, I'm very excited that Blake's going to be taking the reins this year on that. But yeah, it's going to be a fun time between Ergo X and HFES. It's yeah, be nuts. yeah, I'm really bummed I can't make it this year, but uh, I'm excited to listen as a naive listener, um, someone who's not like in on the uh the actual conversation and like just to kind of see how that how that is yeah you know? it'll be fun to kind of it'll be an interesting challenge for me because as everybody knows like nick runs most of the show especially when we've done the hfes stuff so it'll be an interesting challenge for me by myself and we'll have a couple people to help out while we're there um but it's i feel like it's gonna be a lot of fun i've never been to seattle i'm really excited for this year's ergo ergo x symposium because there's going to be so much more going on like, yeah not just exoskeletons we're going to be doing like VR ar and vr oh my god i'm it's missing gonna be it i miss it's okay time it's okay I, my first born child i gotta keep reminding myself that yes <laughs> anyway uh that's it for today uh let us know what you guys think of the news stories this week did you like drones 
Drones, drones, drones. Drones, drones, drones. Would you drone? <laughs> Would you drone? If a drone, drone, drone. Uh, you can join us the discussion. If you did like those stories, you can join the discussion on our Slack or follow us on any of us. I can't read today. It's a, You know what? It's a Tuesday. Tuesdays it's are weird. weird. Tuesdays are weird, right? Uh, <laughs> you can join the discussion on our Slack or follow us on any of our social media channels at A Tractors Podcast. If you want to write into the show, it's show at humanfactorscast.com. If you like what you hear and want to support the show, you can leave us a review on your podcast medium of choice or consider supporting us on Patreon and get access to all of our Human Factors Cast infinite episodes. Uh, and of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. I want to thank Mr. Blake Arnsdorf for being on the show today. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about Pizza Hut? If they want to talk about Pizza Hut drones, <laughs> you can find me anywhere on social media at Don't Panic UX. I was trying to find something that was totally outside the realm of what we talked about today, and you still managed to bring it back. Yes! A special thanks to Jeff Olson for our video editing each and every week. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, Pizza Hut. Pizza Hut. Drones! It depends! It depends! It depends.